I think very much that the mandates are targeting, I think it's targeting everyone, but I know that minority people are going to suffer as a result of it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. We've got a wonderful show today. We're here with a really wonderful person who we just came across um, looking at all sorts of stuff. We're with Trisha Lindsay, an attorney, a former school teacher, an advocate for freedom, and we are so grateful that you're here. Thank you, Trisha. We really appreciate it. Um, I just want to start off for people who do not know you. Could you maybe just give us kind of a little background about yourself? Because you've got a really interesting background. Oh, wow. Um, sure. Thank first, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, I'm honored. Who am I? Um, <laughs> well, I have a 20 plus um, year experience, 20, 20 plus years experience in education. As, an, as a teacher and a um, administrator, I've worked in from the Archdiocese the, of New York um, to the New York City and then Yonkers Public School System. It is widely known that the tobacco and diet industries lobby governments with scientific propaganda for years until proven guilty in court. The artificial treatment of our water is the next corporate deception. For example, virtually every nation in Europe has rejected the use of artificial fluoride. International studies since the 40s have repeatedly shown that endocrine and neurological effects increase after repeated consumption, even at the levels accepted by U.S. government. Epic Water Filters is the most thorough industry-grade filtration system that Houston Ensemble has ever used. They reduce heavy metals up words of 99.5% such as lead and mercury, bacteria like E. coli, and poisons like chromium, nitrate, and fluoride. Join us in our journey to living a toxin-free life and get your epic water filter using discount code Houston Ensemble lowercase one word. That's Houston Ensemble lowercase one word for 20% off your epic water filter. Um, I did that for 20 plus years. I wore multiple hats there. Um, it was my experiences in education that sparked my interest, or I think it just fueled it or reminded me of my interest in the law. For a number of years, I would walk around and tell colleagues, you know, you're going to see me. I, I used to use the word lobbying. I would not lobby now, but pretty much advocating for education. I always said it, and I kind of said it in jest, but I was pretty much serious. Um, because of what I saw happening in education, the inequities, um, the disparities, um, the school to prison pipeline, if, if, if I can say. And so that kind of, you know, as the years went on, I just started watching certain things happening. I remember about eight years, about, no, I think my last four years, four or five years, I started saying there's an experiment going on. And somebody's collecting data. And my colleagues would say, what are you talking about? I said, there's something wrong. There's an increase in learning disabilities, emotional disabilities. Um, there's something happening, you know? And I think something was put either in the food, the prenatal vitamins or somewhere. But I said, these kids are like experiments and now they're collecting data. Not realizing that this was coming, right? The time that we're sitting in is coming right now. So I, I remained in education as long as I could. Can't fight the system that's feeding you. I realized I had to get out the system in order to deal with um, the issues that I saw. And then upon leaving, going to law school full time while keeping, well, part time somewhat, while maintaining my position um, in education. Um, I graduated and just pretty much just walked away. I said, it's time to go. And I left. I'm the kind of person, I, I'm a risk taker. And when I feel that it's time to move, when I feel I've reached my peak um, or I've gotten to the maximum level of what I can do to effectuate change, then I know it's time to change the platform. And that's what I felt from being in the classroom and being an administrator. I felt like a change that I really wanted to make and that I that needed to be made, I could not make from the position that I was in. And so I literally just became an administrator and even became um, received 
licensing and my degree to become a superintendent. But I didn't want to do that because there again, you're still within the system, right? It's very, it's a very political position, but it's your control pretty much. You you have some power, but you're still controlled. And so I just did it for the experience so that I could understand, you know, um, how school districts function, how, you know, what the leadership, what kind of leadership is required of you on, on that level and what you're dealing with. And so I left education, went into law um civil rights and constitutional law as well as a criminal attorney and i do some other matters um family law and things of things of that um sort but um civil rights and constitutional law that's that's my that's my passion that's that's where it sits for me criminal law just comes in on that because i have an um of course a lot of times when you have um accused persons you know their constitutional rights are often violated civil rights and violated. So for me, it's not getting, um, having someone uh, exonerated if they've committed a crime. It's more so ensuring that the sentences are not disparate and that they receive a fair shake, you know, and that they receive a trial that they are due under the constitution of our great United States. So that's who I am. I'm a mother, <laughs> you know, I'm a regular person just with a big mouth. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the reasons, as Armin said a little bit ago, that we wanted to bring you on was because of the passion that you spoke with that when we you know, saw one of your speeches. Um, we also, I think, I think we found you through Kevin Jenkins, who's okay. another kind of activist in this realm. And, but we saw you and we were like, wow. We need to have her on. We've also been wanting to have on a lawyer slash constitutional lawyer as it's a very important right now. But mm -hmm. and I know Armin's been talking about that a lot. So, well, I don't even know where to start. Um, I kind of had a place that I wanted to start just to make a build a picture for people to, to understand where we're coming from. And you told me a little about about your Jamaican perspective, which I want to know more about. So I'm going to start off like this. Okay, the other day I saw a commercial on YouTube when I was uh I was looking at this uh this this trader uh stock market trader channel on okay. YouTube. And he's got a lot of followers. He's made some good calls. So I'm just listening to his analysis and right before this commercial comes on about the lost skills of our forefathers. Vaguely speaking, that was the title of the book. And he said, you're going to want to learn how to build a house, how to repair it, how to find food, how to get heating for yourself, et cetera, et cetera. These skills that our forefathers have, the essential survival skills may be very useful for us in the near future. And then he said, one food item that I highly recommend everybody have on their kitchen table when this, if and when this time comes is what do you think? I mean, he knows. What do you think, Trisha? One food item. Ah, I'm not sure. What is well, you might be surprised, right? I don't know. Kind of close, lard, right? Lard, lard, lard. Oh. And I'll explain okay. to you why because I know a lot of more than I want to know about lard. Okay, tell me because that's something I don't know a lot. About. Lard is, <laughs> is highly concentrated fat. It's very difficult to penetrate even for bacteria. It's very difficult for a bacteria to culture in lard, which is surprising, right? You think of lard, you wouldn't think that it's a clean you know, thing. But it's also a cooking agent, and it can be used in a variety of foods for frying, for boiling, and it can be used as a preservative for food. And it never has to be refrigerated. It never has to be refrigerated. Now, let me tell you why this is important. In 1985, when the Soviet Union began their reconstruction program, their own Build Back Better program, which they literally called reconstruction, or perestroika in Russian, the, one, the number one thing they started doing is acquisition. Acquisition of everything. Acquisition of houses, acquisition of farmland, acquisition of food, acquisition of businesses. You people say, oh, they're not making cars. The car prices are up. They did that too. And then people say the quality of the used cars is garbage, but they're selling it for obscene amounts. They did that too. 
And one item that everybody had on their shelves because they were using it to basically sell for extra cash because the only cash people had was government checks. Mm. Ever, you, you heard that before? Was lard. So when my mother was pregnant and there was a civil war breaking out in her region, which might happen here too, by the way. We'll get into that. Mm -hmm. On the way from Georgia, the country of Georgia, to Russia where she was trying to escape to this... Uh, coastal region in Russia called Sochi. It's about 160, 100, something like that kilometers. She would pay her way through lard. Okay? So if she, if she couldn't walk anymore because she, she was too dang pregnant, she would sell some lard. If she needed a train ticket because one train over here worked, thank God, she would sell some lard. And people don't understand. I didn't find it funny when I watched that commercial. My heart sank. People think, oh my God, this guy's talking about lard. What is this guy talking about, right? <laughs> this is not funny, guys. You know, you, we take for granted, we think America is an unstoppable force. Well, it was for a period of time. Mm -hmm. Okay? But this country is being sold out like Russia was. And it's, it's a nightmare for me to sit here and watch these things happening again and again. And people think everything's okay because they just came back from Walmart. So that's where I wanted to start. Now, I'm going to throw it back at you. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about Jamaica, how Jamaica is handling things, because I'm very curious about that. Well, I haven't been there in a little bit, and this is just basically this. I think they're dealing with it the same way. It's here. You have pockets of people. You know, you have a, a certain part of the population that's fighting it, that's standing up. And I think they're beginning to stand up even more um, against it. And then you have some that are like sheep, right? That are just going along with the vaccines and the mandates and accounting their blessings. Um, the what they what I think is a benefit for those that are against the vaccines, or I should say, yes, that's against the COVID vaccine. I think the fact that they don't have the resources that we have to cover things up, they get to see firsthand what's happening they may know a neighbor or a colleague or someone like that whose family member took it and died or who took it took the vaccine and and you know got hurt or suffered a severe adverse reaction and so they 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 they're much close up to it you know upfront and personal to it whereby here America, we have the resources to hide things, right? To cover it up. The hospitals can deny what's happening. They, someone goes into the hospital here um, and has dies of heart disease and they put COVID on a death certificate. The hospital can cover that up. In Jamaica, it's different. You know, the things are a lot different. If my husband goes into the hospital and dies of heart disease and I tell the next person, that person's gonna tell the next person that things travel by word of mouth very quickly down there. Um, so you have a batch that's 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 um, fighting it. What's interesting to me is, which I was discussing last night, I'm waiting to see what they're going to do as far as the vaccine mandate for for the visitors. Jamaica has not done that yet, and if you know anything about the Jamaican um, economy, a lot of it rests upon tourism. And so while you may have you have tourists that are vaccinated that are visiting the island, you have a number of people that are not vaccinated, including returning residents, right? You have people who are living here, but they go home every year for Christmas, for New Year's, for Easter. You know, Jamaicans are regular visitors to their country. Most Jamaicans visit regularly. Um, and so the, the government risks losing a large portion of that um, financial support, that part of the economy, if they move towards vaccine mandates like a lot of other islands have been doing. And it's interesting because there's some islands that I don't even understand why they're um, implementing vaccine mandates because they already, um, their, their tourism rate is nowhere near islands like Jamaica and some of the more, other more popular islands. And to me, they're cutting off their... Um, their, 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 their hand, you know, by implementing these vaccine mandates, because now people are just going to say, okay, we'll go elsewhere, you know? So that's one take. What we were talking about before were the freedoms and people with, with um, food. And you were saying that they were, it's a, a neo-Christian community. Mm -hmm. Is that what you were saying? Yeah. 
Yeah, and they're planting food. I mean, let's face it, they have more land, right? And they, they can plant food more freely than we can. For us, we have to go and purchase land. And then, I mean, for me, if I wanted to purchase land, it's not going to be anywhere near my home that I can farm. You know what I mean? That I could grow food on and things of that nature. So it's a bit more difficult. And so for us in this country, we're a lot more dependent on the government here than people in the island of Jamaica. We have in this country created a system of dependency. It's just how it is. The school system feeds the prison population, right? Or it feeds government jobs or it feeds Wall Streeters. And in all ends, you're tied, right? If you're in a government job, now to keep that wonderful government job with great benefits and job security, now roll up your sleeve and take this vaccine, right? On Wall Street, a lot of those companies are requiring the same thing. And even if even if you say, okay, I'm not taking it, most of those people cannot walk away because they're locked in the prison of what America has required them, the standard or the level of um, the financial status that they are they are required to live on, right? Each of those people, they have homes that they have to um, now pay for, mortgages, you know, kids are in certain schools. And so how do I give up this lifestyle, right? And so they're locked in. And then you have those that are not working, that are on government assistance, and to keep those benefits, now they're going to have freedoms tied to that. And so on all ends. And so the only people in this whole equation that are really free are the outliers, right? The outliers, the ones that are working for themselves, the ones that have stepped out of that system, the ones that you know they can't really tie to. And so I find that um, the citizens of the islands, and as we were talking about Jamaica, those that are farming their own land, you know, they, I just think they have a level of freedom that we don't have up here because it's not that great American dream, that great American, you know, that facade, that life that we're that we are um, all trying to live and hold on to and create. And so it's it's a lot different, you know. They don't have welfare in in Jamaica. They, they don't have, you can get some government assistance maybe, but nothing like what's here. So you pretty much learn to work, you know, and, and fend for yourself and do what you have to do. I know a number of people in Jamaica, whether the, regardless of the level um, of life that they live on, they, a number of these people can go outside in the yard and pick a mango. They can go and get something out, you know, their garden in the back. They can eat off the land. And when you, no one controls your food, you know, that's major. And most people in Jamaica are not paying mortgages. If they have a home, they built that home. You know, they built it and it's fully paid for, you know, whereby most of us here, we're paying mortgages. We're locked in for 30 years, sometimes 40 or 50, depending on if we take our second mortgages. So that's what I meant about the level of freedom, you know. And one thing to go along with that, you know, thankfully, luckily, Armin and I do music full time right now, but we also do this and are working on our show and whatnot. So that is in some sense, a little bit working for ourselves, which has granted us some freedom. And then also being in Texas, it's a little more, a little more free than a lot of other uh, states, contrary to somewhere like New York or something. But um, one thing that I was going to say is we're seeing a lot of I would say political hypocrisy, especially just the other day, you know, uh, nobody from South Africa is allowed to come to the United States. There's a travel ban on South Africa and it's all over the news. And obviously Joe Biden did that. And when, you know, Trump did that back in the day, right kind of when COVID was starting, people immediately said he was racist. And, you know, I'm not going to comment one way or the other about the racism on it, but I just think the overt hypocrisy is really unfortunate. And I was kind of wondering what you think about that and where you stand on all of that. It didn't shock me when I saw that because I know it was coming because a few weeks ago they put out, a, um, there was a report that was um, released saying that um, the numbers, the number of COVID um, cases in Africa were not accurate what we were hearing because they weren't reporting the cases. I forget all the countries that they named. Um, so I said, oh, something else is coming. I said they're trying to, 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 to justify their next move. And so they have to 
create. You know, they have to build it, the foundation. It's pretty much what they did in this country last year, right? Last year, I was telling people, my family, friends, I said, we cannot comply with these mandates. We cannot just lock ourselves up in our homes. We cannot wear these masks. We cannot, because I said, what they're doing is they're going to create, they're watching. I said, it's a test. And the more we comply, the more they're going to push. And I said, by next year, they're going to start cutting back our travel and saying, we can't travel if we don't have, if we don't take a vaccine. And we're not going to be able to purchase food. We're not going to be able to move about. And they said, oh, that's crazy. They would never do that. I said, they will never do it. <laughs> I said, yes, they will. And they're doing, they're, they're just setting the foundation and setting it up. And where are we right now? That's exactly what's happening. So with Africa, they want, the Africa is resisting the vaccine, right? And so it's cutting back, first of all, depending on how deep down the rabbit hole you want to go in this conversation, we all know what's going on with Africa, right? And vaccines and what has gone on there for years, the maiming of people, the, um, the deaths, the number of deaths that have occurred, the sterilization, right? So if Africa is pushing back and saying no, well, the number of countries there, then what's going to happen, right? The plan goes, right? The, the, the mass sterilization, the mass depopulation, all of this that is part of this goal and this agenda, it's not going to work because the people that should be taking the vaccines, they're not taking it um, to the level that we wanted them to. So now we have to find a reason. We have to get in there. Pushing, saying um, the finances are not working, right? The money, the threats, none of that is working. So they have to find another way of getting it in. So to me, it, it didn't shock me. It didn't surprise me when Joe Biden put the, 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 the travel ban, they can't come here. Okay. People can adjust to that. Everyone doesn't have to come to America, right? People can adjust. It's fine. It's fine. But um, that's not enough. So they have to find a way to get it into the country. They have to find a way of squeezing people. So it wasn't shocking to me. The hypocrisy is, it's major. We have, in this country, you have a certain sect of the population and i will say my people black people we vote we vote blindly democratic a lot of times you know and we've been loyal to a party that's not been loyal to us you know and i mean just for the fact that joe biden received the votes that he received whether the, the election was robbed or not just the fact that he received any of the votes from the minority population quote unquote minority population is an issue Right, because he wrote the crime bill that that led to mass incarceration. So for any of us to be voting for him, that's an issue, right? Kamala Harris, I'm no fan of hers either, because she 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 incarcerated more black and brown um, males in California during her her reign of terror over there. So I mean, it's you know it, the, the 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 political hypocrisy. It's nothing different than our, than what's been going on in this country for years. I just thank God as much as I, I, I love technology and I hate it, but I love it for the fact that now nothing is really hidden. If you want the information, you can find the information and you can't make it. There's no excuses. No one can say, I did not know because you can find out, you know, and that's just where we are, you know. It's odd that when we talk to people, friends, colleagues, whatever, uh, maybe who are very much in support of, let's say, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, that even when you bring up facts on both sides, you know, just bring up facts about anybody, that everybody is so emotionally tied to these people. They're like, well, we, well, the other people did bad things too. And we're like, yeah, of course they also did bad things, but that's not who we're talking about right now. And we're just in the context of what we're doing right now. So, or, you know, like, um, I'm not sure if you saw Robert F. Kennedy's new book that just came out. It's called The Real Anthony Fauci, and I've been yes. reading it. And, you know, that's another person where they're like, oh, he's been an amazing guy and he sacrificed so much. And it's like, you know, you don't have to uh, just like succumb to him. You can he's he's the leader of this thing that's going on and we should be allowed to critique him and a person in that position must be critiqued no matter how well they are doing. Yeah. Are you saying that this is what they were saying about Fauci or Robert Kennedy? Uh, Fauci. I'm saying that okay. a person who's in that role of leadership, even if they're doing a decent job, 
is subject to critique. And it's unfortunate that people will not, um, they won't even do that because they feel so tied politically or through their identity or ideology or something that you can't even have an honest conversation about it. Well, let me tell you, they stopped, to, they, they started, um, they started discouraging thinking in this country a long time ago. Analysis is not something that that has been encouraged. Um, I would say probably the past seven to ten years, probably even more. And you saw it in the school. You see it in the school systems. You see it that's out there, right? I mean, the word conspiracy theory. Where did that come from? If anyone knows, from my understanding, and whoever's watching can check it, and I'll be I will be happy to be corrected. But conspiracy theory came from I believe it was the CIA that made up that term after Robert Kennedy's death, assassination, because people were questioning his death and assassination and trying to figure it out. And so this word conspiracy theory was made up to discourage the population from thinking. We wanted it to stop. So that's why people, anytime you start analyzing and digging into to what's going on and questioning what's being presented to you, what's the first thing that people say? Oh, that's a conspiracy theory. That's a conspiracy theory. You're a conspiracy theorist. And I tell people, yes, I am. Because if you know what the word conspiracy means and you know what a theory is, then that just means that I'm thinking, right? A conspiracy is two or more people that have agreed to carry forth a plan. So we all conspire every day. I conspire to pick up my daughter from work. I conspire. We conspire every day. And a theory is a hypothesis that has been tested hundreds of times and has been proven true, right? So it's simply an idea. So if you present something to me that doesn't make sense, if you present something to me that doesn't line up in my mind and I start to question it, what is the problem? What is the problem if I am analyzing? Isn't that what we're supposed to do? In academia, we're no longer allowed to think. You have Professor Crispin from NYU who has been teaching this course that he's been teaching about the media for years. Uh, a top-rated top rated professor who's now terminated because he was teaching the same course, but just told his students to think. Don't just take what the media is telling you, think. And now he's terminated. You have Mary Holland who was terminated from NYU, same thing. So when did academia stop us and tell us to stop thinking? Something is wrong with that picture. I thought that's why we went to school. I thought that's where dialogue happened, rich discourse, right? Diverse mindsets and thoughts and backgrounds where we all sit in a room and we discuss different perspectives. And whether we agree or agree to disagree, we all get it out and we discuss and have this conversation. That's not allowed anymore. It's not allowed. And that is bizarre. Why? It's not only bizarre, it's extremely startling. Uh, I keep thinking about the similarities because I'm, it's, it's like I'm reliving a nightmare because I see the same things happening. The intelligentsia or the established intelligentsia is basically weeding out all naysayers. And this has happened in my system as well. On the ground level, the citizenry is being gaslighted to death. Basically, people are being gaslighted to the point where they think they just, they just need to zip it up go to their office or whatever, go wake up in the morning, do their Zoom work, and that's it. And now it's going to get to the point where you're not even going to be able to travel anywhere with particular papers. And I've been through that as well. And, and, and these are startling similarities. And like you said, two years ago, I was telling all of my friends, this is a Trojan horse. They've concocted something quite brilliant, and this is a Trojan horse. I'm, I'm telling them, you won't be able to travel. You won't be able to work. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Nobody wants to hear that because it's hard to accept. It, it's truly, especially when you do not have the experience and you do not have the wherewithal. You haven't seen what people are really capable of. Okay, let's face it. We've had a comfortable life here in general. Even if you're dead broke in the United States, you can go <laughs> donate plasma for 70 bucks and you're good. Okay, yes. that, that, is a, that is heaven. People don't get it. People don't get it. We only had enough food in the Soviet Union for rice, beans, and, and, and the cow that we had in the back that the state wouldn't even allow us to have. We'd have to keep those animals in, in cells. I mean, people, man, they think this is funny. Every great civilization is going to collapse. I'm not saying it's a ride around the corner, but heck, I mean, how many more signs do you need?
Absolutely. And 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 I urge people to really be really be cognizant of this because the next thing that's coming is a systemic collapse. I don't know when. It could be just next year. It could be in, in five years. It could be in 2030. But a systemic collapse is coming because that's going to be the last step they take to acquire everything from under our noses. So yeah. go ahead and laugh it off and tell me I'm whatever you want to say. But I'm going to just say I told you so. And, and Chad and I are going to be on our farmland sustaining ourselves. <laughs> exactly. And you're going to be wondering if I need to get the 20th, you know what, so I can go back to work. Uh, hopefully, if they're still around, right? Because, they're still around. I mean, let's face it, there are people, there are a lot of casualties that have occurred already behind this vaccine. And there are a number of that, that are coming. You and know, I want to mention I one more thing. I'm sorry to interrupt. Sure. This got really real to me recently because my mm -hmm. entire family has been fighting against this as or, or, as much as possible but i have a, a niece for example who is a, a government employee she's a, she's an officer a cop basically in russia and she was holding off on getting it holding off on getting it but see what they do they make you take a 250 dollar test bi-weekly now you don't make you don't make anything being a police officer in russia okay like here so she couldn't afford it anymore. And she took the first one. She almost died. And she took the second one. She almost died. And she took the third one. She still can't move her legs. So to say that I'm pissed is an understatement. This has gone very personal to me. So I, I, I don't care anymore about people wanting to say, well, I don't want to hang out with Armin. People like you and me, if we're not careful here, we're going to be the, 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 the saviors of this country. And I don't, for, frankly, want that responsibility, to be perfectly honest. I don't want it either. <laughs> I don't want it either. But I kind of think we, we're being assigned, we've been assigned a task, right? I explained to a family member of mine who wanted to challenge me continuously on my stand, you know, with this. You guys have seen me speak in, um, in person, you know, speak. And I was being challenged and being told I said things that I, I didn't say. Whether or not that's my personal stance on it, right now, discuss vaccine. I said, but most of the time when I speak, I'm speaking on constitutional rights, mandates, our liberties, our freedoms, things of that nature. Well, I was being questioned on my theology behind the vaccine and things of that nature. And I said, I didn't say anything like that, <laughs> but okay. You know, and um, I said, I, I, I pretty much said to them that, you can, it was, I just lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. What was the last thing that you said, Chad? I, uh, we were talking about, uh, my, my niece who finally just couldn't afford it anymore and took the shots. And uh, I mean, it floored her. It floored her. I mean, I still remember her calling my mother and crying. Like, I don't, I didn't have any other choice. You know, I, I did what I had to do. And I'm, and, and it's like, yeah, so you have, you have people that are now that are going and taking this vaccine and saying, I have to work or I want to travel and I want to do these things. And I'm saying, but you're not, you may not live to work. Right. And now insurance companies are not treating people for COVID injuries. I don't know if you guys know that before of they course. were saying, now you have to pay extra if you're not vaccinated. That was mm -hmm. the first thing that was coming. If you're not vaccinated and you need to use your insurance, there's certain things that they're not covering, or you're going to have to pay extra, um, for your, um, your premium coverage. And now from what I'm gathering, people are going to the hospitals and insurance companies are denying claims from vaccine injuries, from people who are showing up in the hospital sick, harmed, and they're not covering them. So what is happening, right? What's happening? And you have people, what I tell, I said to a number of people, and I've said this speaking, that we have to let go of some of these pleasures. You know, we have to let go. I told a friend of mine, I said, Instead of taking the vaccine, why didn't you just, she, she said to me, how am I supposed to pay my rent? How am I supposed to pay, you know, to live? I said, but you're not going to be able to, if God forbid, you know, barring a miracle and hopefully your body can withstand this vaccine and it's, it's, it's harm, you know, it's harmful um, effects. But if you can't, then how are you going to maintain that anyway? And so she said, oh, well, I'll just, you know, thank God I have family. I will just move in, you know, with somebody and X, Y, Z. So I said, so why wouldn't you have done that first? You know, why wouldn't you have done that first? Why wouldn't you have preserved your health, 
preserved your life and, you know, jump to plan B first, you know, and but people are just not thinking. And that's the, that's the, um, that's where the, 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 the slavery piece comes in, right? We're a slave to this whole system. This American dream of having his home, driving certain cars, living in certain places, having certain amount of clothes. I mean, I like to dress nice. I want to live somewhere nice. I want to do all these things. But right about now, we have to really put things into perspective. We have to really prioritize and make some real changes. Farming, food, I mean, those are primary because we're not going to be able to get food um, soon. And then even the food that they're selling, that they're providing for the popular, it's not even good. I mean, I don't know about you, but I can tell when I buy chicken and I make a chicken, I can literally tell sometimes that I've gotten a chicken that has, I don't know, with hormones. I mean, literally, I... Don't get me started. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I mean, there are just some things that we have some changes that we have to make. And that's the freedoms that I'm talking about with the islands. There are certain freedoms that we have over what they have. But when it comes to things of that nature, they're in a better position, if you ask me. Another thing that, um, you know, regarding the food is I think that because, like you were saying, we're very enslaved, entrenched in the systems that we have is especially when it comes to health is turning back to a more natural holistic style of health and i think actually i saw that you were maybe speaking at or in communication with this um uh doctor speaking event in tennessee where they were yes this going weekend. yes oh okay perfect yeah where they were you know going back to sort of a holistic health approach and i know that when i got sick maybe last August, you know, I probably, probably had COVID. I, I did not get a test, but I probably had it, I would assume. And, um, I went to, I, I feel like my primary care physician is really just like a, a Chinese herbalist. And so I just went there, got some herbs and then did natural stuff and took my vitamins and yeah, I got better. So I think we need to go back to that. And I think the food plays a really important thing uh, in all of this. And we know that, like you were just saying, the food that is sold to the masses today is filled with chemicals. It's filled with hormones. It's got pus in it, <laughs> all this stuff. Tell them about the, the gangrene you had to cut out all the chicken. Right. And so I said this on a podcast that we did you know, uh, a couple weeks ago or something. But when I worked at a, a nice sushi restaurant, I would be working with the chicken that we got and it was covered in like a green slime that I had to take off of it. Mm. And I was like, this should not be happening. You know, we shouldn't be serving people chicken. I mean, we cut it off and clean it, but like still, that's still yeah. still yeah. part of it. And I, I don't think a lot of people understand that. And then another thing that we've saying is that, you know, especially in New York, you've got mayor... Uh, Mike de Blasio eating Shake Shack, telling people that they're going to get burgers and fries if if they take the shot. And I'm like, that. What is this? And look at the 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 the, the irony of that. The owner of Shake Shack. What is his name? Um, he does not have a good reputation, and he's actually known as a racist. So it's interesting. <laughs> that Mayor de Blasio would be using Shake Shack burgers and fries to invite people in to get the vaccine and Shake Shack would be the company that's supporting it. And now, if we think about this, analyze it, break it down, we're considered a conspiracy theorist, right? But I'm sorry, that's Mayor de Blasio and the owner of Shake Shack <laughs> De Blasio is pushing a, a very arbitrary and capricious, arbitrary mandate that's in New York that doesn't make any sense, right? It's not neutral on its face. It's very um, selective and important. Um, so he's pushing that. So his agenda is not changed. It's not, you know, what he's trying to make up. And then you have the owner of state. And so they and decide to push this um, 
this program to get burgers and fries, you will come and get the vaccine. So I guess that's my last death row. You know, what do you want? Do you want lobster? I mean, because that's what happened to me. You know, and it's just so, it's just bizarre. First of all, Mayor de Blasio, I, I've lost all respect. For him, okay. So I was just saying that I've lost all respect for Mayor de Blasio because I believe to me, he used his, his dark skinned black wife and his mulatto children, his son with an afro. I remember when he was, um, oh, wow. you know, running for the may, you know, to be mayor and they were up front, you know, and, and, and sent her. And I believe used them. Not, I'm sure with her, you know, she was okay with it. I'm sure, <laughs> you know. But to 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 gain the minority vote in New York, and now he has turned around and is doing this, you know. And then when I saw him with the burgers and fries, I said, what What is happening right now? You know, what what is really going on? He's using burgers and fries. Who is he trying to? That's not the elite that he's trying to pull. That's not the professional person he's trying to get, right? Mm -hmm. That he's trying to inveigle into um, taking this vaccine. Mm -hmm. That's a certain population, you know, a certain mm -hmm. level of, of person. And I have no respect for him anymore. We all know his name is not de Blasio, right? He has like two or three other names. <laughs> Did uh, New York City also just elect a new mayor? Yes. Okay, now I want to get on that for one second. What is really interesting, and this is another thing that I want you to talk about, is the leader of Black Lives Matter in New York, Hawk Newsom. He's the leader in the chapter of New York, Hawk Newsom, um, is very against mandates. And he's coming at it from a very... This is, you know, disparaging towards minorities. It's reminiscent of old times. And I know that he and some others just met with the mayor. And I know that they're, I don't think they're a fan of him. And I was wondering, well, let me say this first. I'm happy to see that two, you know, generally opposing groups, like we'll just call it far right, far left, mm -hmm. actually will converge on something like this. And so when I saw Hawk Newsom talking about that, I was like, okay, well, that's good. I appreciate that he's mm. up for that. Um, and then what I was gonna ask you about is regarding you know, race and regarding how this is reminiscent of, as Kevin Jenkins said, he thinks it's you know, reminiscent of Jim Crow laws or it could become that in the future. What do you think about that? I, uh, let me just make sure I'm, I'm understanding your question. Are, are you asking me what do I think about race in terms of the vaccine mandates and where we're headed? And if it targets minorities, is that what you're asking? A little, yes, a little bit of that. Sorry, I was unclear. A little bit of that. And then also, do you foresee potentially creating different classes of people, AKA a class that, you know, has their shots and a class that doesn't, it actually does not have to do with race anymore. And then we would get into a sort of old time law. So I've said that this is the new segregation. It's the new discrimination. It's the new racism. Racism exists in this country because it's what this country was pretty much founded on or what it eventually became, right? Because the first people, um, Africans that came to this country were not slaves. A lot of people don't know that. They don't teach us the history because they don't want us to know our history. But they weren't, right? That became, um, a, that system was put in place when the planters elite, if you would call them, realized that the Africans and the Irish were realizing the power that they had and the intellect that they had and the knowledge and the, the, the health. And that's a long history. <laughs> but, and then that system was put in place over time and then people's, people groups were split. Um, and one was put over the other and so forth and so on. That's how we be, had, the, that's where we got the police force from. And, you know, all these different levels of um, socioeconomic status, you know, in this country levels of people, you know, that people live on. I think very much that the mandates are targeting, I think it's targeting everyone, but I know 
that minority people are going to suffer as a result of it because there are only about 40% of us that have taken the vaccine, despite the numbers that they're trying to present, right? And so with that, whether they, whether you, with that, you're gonna create a subset and you're gonna create a whole new set of laws around it that's going to marginalize us even more. Because now what? We're gonna go back now to slave passports, right? If you're clean or unclean, you're a slave or not slave, right? This goes back to the Holocaust. It goes back to slavery. It goes back to all the 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 the, the, the what happened to the to the Native Americans that were here. All of it is all wrapped up together. It's just now instead of dividing us by race, they're using race as a distraction, while they divide us based upon vaccinated and unvaccinated to try to. You can choose if you get it or not. What about that? What would your response be to that if someone said that to you? You can't choose your race, but you can choose whether or not to get a vaccine. Right. Absolutely. But actually, they're trying to make it so that you can't choose whether or not to get the vaccine. Isn't that what's happening? They're trying to take away that choice, right? Now to go to New York City for, for not that I, I care, you know, I, I'm, I can give up whatever needs to be given up. But for, for um, New Year's Eve, they're, they're, you have to be, you have to show a vaccine passport to get into Times Square on New Year's Eve. So now you're going to have officers on the street checking cars. I mean, this is this is a little bit much. But let me finish with your your question. Um, you have minorities who, to keep their jobs, they're going to have to get a vac a pass uh, a vaccine, right? Because let's look at um, the percentage of minorities living that are either working class, that are below the poverty line, or barely that that the middle class. I don't even know. Does the middle class still exist in this country? <laughs> I'm not even sure anymore, right? And so for those people, the average, but they have to keep working in order to take care of their families, right? And so who is that going to impact? It's going to impact African-Americans. It's going to impact Black people, right? Because most of us have to work in order to maintain our households. How many of these households are single parent households, regardless of what? My dad died when I was nine. So I came up in a single parent household, right? If this was going on at that time, I don't know what would have happened. As a minority person or as a human being, if I take the vaccine, my life can be compromised, my health is compromised, and I am now doing it under duress and coercion, right? Because especially for me, if I choose to, that's one thing. But if I do it simply because I'm trying to hold on to freedoms, or hold on to benefits, hold on to my rights, um, that's an issue because now you've compromised, I'm compromised in, in one way. And now I become a slave even more to this system, right? Because I have now bargained. I've, I've my, my rights and my standing is now compromised and I'm no longer, com I'm really now not free. If I don't take it, there's then these rights, benefits and freedoms are taken from me on the other end. 40%, only 40%, about 40% of minorities have taken the vaccine, which means now we're going to be locked out of greater parts of society. No restaurants, no food, no travel, right? Um, and so it is Jim Crow all over again, right? If you don't have this card to show that you are entitled to this right or you've, you've done what's needed, you've complied so that you know, you have the right to come into this store or the right to get on this plane or the right to go to this particular area, now, then you can't go. And so is it becoming Jim Crow all over again? Absolutely. Your kids kids are no longer going to be allowed in school, right, to, to be educated if they don't get a vac, if they don't take the vaccine. They cannot go to college. Um, but yet in this country, what's, and you know, as I'm talking to you, it's just really interesting. Something just dawned on me. 
because the number, the percentage of the percentage of minorities entering college has been increasing steadily over the past few years, right? And graduating. And now all of a sudden, these mandates are put in place and this vaccine is put in place, whereby now kids are gonna be excluded from the educational system on all levels, right? Which means now they're gonna be locked out of the job market, which means now they're gonna be locked out. They're not gonna be able to take care of themselves, right? So, I mean, there's so much that's going on. So do I think it can become Jim, Jim Crow all over, all over again? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it is becoming that. And that's why if we don't stand up, it's going to be a very different place. The only thing is now it's everyone. You know, it's no longer just Black folks. It's no longer just Latinos. no longer just the Jews. It's no longer just the... It's everyone. If you're standing up for your rights, you fit into this group over here. If you're not, and or if you're just rolling over and complying, then you're fine. Go ahead and do it. But I, what I do know is that as much as they're trying to pit vaccinated and unvaccinated against each other, it's bigger than that. Because once they use the vaccinated to, to go against the unvaccinated, their rights are going to be taken away as well, right? They're going to be compromised as well. So it's just the beginning. If they're just being used to set up the system and put the system in place. But in actuality, it's everyone that's being compromised right now. And to be honest with you, we're the ones that all these people are going to be running to in a very short while to ask, what do we do? How do we get around? How, what can we do? You know, it's, it's, it's going to switch. And that's why they're trying to keep us separate. That's why they're trying to create this facade that, you know, uh, X amount of people are getting the vaccine, the vaccines, um, the, the, the people going to the hospital are the unvaccinated and all these, these, these lies, you know, and um, exaggerations that are being reported. And so we have to become vigilant. We have to become armed in multiple ways. Um, we have to look at life differently right now. Um, and we have to be keen and we have to pay attention to everything. And like I, I tell, I often say, we cannot afford to walk around saying anymore, oh, that's not possible. They wouldn't do that. That's not, they wouldn't, that, that sounds crazy. Anything that sounds crazy, look into it. If it seems like something that normally would not have been done, it's being done. You know, I don't know if you all were like this, but I know as I grew as a child, anything that I saw on television or in the movies, I always said it's either being done now or it's on the verge of being done. Right. And so if you think about, is it Enemy of the State with Will Smith and Jack? Um, oh, I forget his name. I think you know who I'm talking about. I don't know. Enemy of the State where Will Smith was a lawyer. He was an attorney. And they pretty much invaded his entire life because he had information on a disc um, that he didn't know he had, <laughs> that he didn't know he had. And they pretty much erased him from the system. He was fired. I mean, he was just all over the place. And the technology, the way that they were able to track him and see everything that he's doing, go, you know, listen to, as soon as he picked up a phone, his voice, you know, was picked up, you know, and they locked, locked into him wherever he was. I mean, we're so far beyond that now. In, in our world, so far beyond that. And so we have to be, we, we have to understand what's going on. This agenda is big. It's, it's like a mass, <laughs> it's like a global war. It's a global war. It's not just an American situation. It's not just a European situation, not just an African situation. These are some really bold, very, evil, very arrogant people that are in charge of what's going on right now. But what I do know is that they're not going to win. That I do know. That I do know. It may seem sometimes like they're, that they're winning, but they're not. Otherwise, they wouldn't be spending trillions of dollars to try to silence us. They wouldn't be spending trillions of dollars from one side of the globe to the next to try to push this, right? And so I believe it's gonna it, it, it's gonna backfire sooner or later because there's no end game. I've asked I've asked many times, what's the end game? What's the end game? 
Because first of all, if you get rid of a certain set of society, who's going to be running certain things? There's certain jobs that these people are not going to do. So if you get rid of the bottom class, <laughs> where does that leave us in this country? Right? If you get rid of everyone, if you get rid of a certain amount, I don't know. It's just very bizarre. It's very interesting. But I do know that we're winning and we're going to win. And we're going to win because you can't the truth is the truth, and it has to come to the surface. It's just unfortunate that we're just going to have to be settled with the fact that we're going to lose some people that we love. There's some people that we're not going to, you know, that are going to separate themselves from us because of the stand that we're taking. Some will cross over to the other side, you know, sort of like how some of the Democrats crossed over to the Republican side, <laughs> you know, at a certain point. Um, it's going to happen. And we just, you know, I don't argue with people. I don't discuss my stance with everyone because I don't need to do that. I'm not trying to convince anyone of anything. If someone wants the news and the information, I'll happily give it to them. But I'm not getting into a debate with someone who's trying to, to convince me that I'm wrong, you know, or that I'm right. I will happily have a discussion, you know, and, and consider varying viewpoints, but I'm not going to ha get into a battle with anyone you know, to defend what I know to be true. And what I know to be true is that this is not what they're making it out to be. I don't want to take the last word from you, but uh, you said people switching sides. And, and I know you know this in your heart, but there is no side. There's humanity, okay? And then there's death. Uh, that that's if you want to pick a side, that those are the sides. There's no red, blue. <laughs> I promise you, when the military boot is on your temple, the last thing you're going to be thinking about is who you put on your voter card. I promise you. So, with that, Trisha, you've been wonderful. I honestly want to keep talking to you, and maybe we can talk not on camera so we can get into some other stuff. <laughs> Yeah, yes. some things that some things you leave off camera, right? Yes. <laughs> we really But there's a book that I would invite everyone to read, and it's called IBM and the Holocaust and War Against the Weak. It's That's a very, a very good, good one. Oh, wow. IBM the system and was used to track and, and, and barcode the Jewish population. And yeah. And it's their involvement in the vaccine card in New York. Again. Oh Here we God. go. History repeats itself. Ooh. Well, Here we go. Trisha, thank you so much. We're so appreciative of you. Thank you for your amazing viewpoint and your history that you're able to impart. Um, to everybody who's watching, we're going to put Trisha's info, you know, website, social media in the description so you can follow her, support her. She's obviously doing amazing work in New York. And um, kind of like we always say, we love to have people on to show that we're actually all a unified people. You know, it doesn't matter what background we come from, but that we're unified in the truth. We're unified in spirit. And we just want to go along with that and promote a message of love and unity. So, Trisha, thank you so much. We'd love to talk to you again. And uh, we'll definitely stay in touch. Definitely. Please do. Thank you. And keep doing what you're doing. More of us are needed and you're helping. This is your role in this fight. Thank you so much.